the whole mess Father Hess is going to talk about started, uh, well, it, it goes back to the original sin, of course, but it started in an intensive way at the end of last century when Pope Leo XIII, who uh, was a very good pope and a very intelligent pope and a very erudite pope uh, and a very gifted pope, but not exactly the best, uh, um, how shall I say, he didn't know people. He was not a good judge of men. And uh, he chose as his secretary of state a certain cardinal called Mariano Rampolla del Tindaro, who unfortunately was not only member of a Masonic lodge, but had founded his own Masonic lodge. So that's when everything started. Cardinal Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro is the one who is responsible for the otherwise strange fact that it needed until 1899 before uh, what is sometimes called the Americanist heresy was condemned, which consists basically in the same types of errors and ecumenism that was officially pronounced in Vatican II. Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro unfortunately had spiritual children spiritual. I don't know if he had natural children. I'm not interested, but he had spiritual children. And uh, when St. Pius X died, one of his own protege, his own spiritual son became Pope, and that's Benedict XV. But we'll come back to that. In 1903, when Leo XIII died, Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro almost became Pope. And here's the reason people like footnotes and sources. Here's the reason why I know that Mariano Rampolo del Tindoro was in, fa in fact a Mason and not just, uh, and this is not just a rumor, because the Empress of Austria, the last Empress of Austria, Zita, was a very good friend of my uncle, Monsignor Hesse, in Vienna, and she told him personally, before she died, that Francis Joseph, the uh, before last Emperor of Austria, who reigned between 1848 until 1916, and 1916, knew that Mariano Rampolla was a Mason. And so he pronounced the uh, century-old veto against Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro by the time he had had two-thirds of the votes. And this is how St. Pius X got elected. This is something that I cannot scientifically prove. You will just have to believe me. My uncle told me that the Empress Sita had told him that. As far as I know, my uncle never lied to me, and as far as I know, the Empress Sita was a very honest person. And this is, of course, family tradition in the Habsburgs. This is not something that would be given to the newspapers, but uh, the Empress, of course, having been the wife of the, the grandnephew of the old Emperor Francis Joseph, knew about these things. And... Uh, so in 1903, um, almost we almost had a, Mas a Masonic Pope. In 1914, we got a Pope who was not exact, could not exactly be called a Masonic Pope, but he was not uh, all too unfriendly towards them. Fortunately, uh, there's good things coming out of everything. The First World War kept the Pope busy enough to stay out of church politics. And uh, in 1922. Pius XI got elected. Now, whatever I say here, I do not believe that Pius XI was in any way bad personally. But uh, again, uh, naive and too trusting, he uh, appointed a certain Cardinal Gaspari, who had been the Secretary of State under Benedict XV, to be his Secretary of State. And Cardinal Gaspari was a sort of spiritual grandchild to Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro. So we get the same tradition going. And there's something much worse about it. Pius XII, who for many so-called conservatives and so-called traditionalists is the most holy of all popes ever, something like this, and the last beautiful, glorious Catholic pope, in fact, was not exactly what some people believe he was. Eugenio Pacelli was not only never in a seminary, except for two years. He had homeschooling, but not the way it is now. This was the other way around in the last century. Pacelli went to high school after the so-called Risorgimento, the separation of church and state in Italy. He went to a, a high school that was is called the... Uh, the uh, uh, help me, Father. The Liceo... Liceo... 
you still got it in Rome. And it was the most secular and anti-clerical of all high schools in Rome, Liceo Visconti. And in the Liceo Visconti, Pacelli was raised. After that, he was taught privately by university professors. And just for the sake of canon law, he went to a seminary for two years. Guess what seminary? He spent the two years of his seminary uh, as a seminarian of all, in, 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 in the, uh, in the uh, Collegio Capranica of all places. Now, the Capranica in Rome was and still is the center of modernism. All the famous modernists that were condemned by Pius X lived in the Capranica or worked for the Capranica or had some connections to the Capranica. Now, I'm not saying that Pius XII was a modernist. In, no, in not a single one of his documents, you will find something wrong. I mean, you can, you can always interpret things in, 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 uh, in, in a negative way and find faults even with uh, the greatest uh, church father's writings. But uh, not, not a single piece of uh, Pius XII's writings could be called anything but Catholic. The problem with Pius XII is what he did. And here is what he did. I do not have to tell the people present, not yet, not, a, not today, uh, that you cannot touch liturgy. Father Trinchard in his book makes that evidently clear, and he's absolutely right about it. No pope and no other person, therefore, has the right to touch liturgy, to change liturgy, or to create anything new in the liturgy. Pius XII did. In 1949, he discovered a certain uh, teacher at the Lateran University in Rome called Annibale Bonini. Does that ring a bell, that name? It was Pius XII who discovered Bonini. It was Pius XII who funded Bonini. It, is twi it was Pius XII who gave Bonini the power to change things. Before I forget to say that, John XXIII, the moment he was pope, threw of Bonini out. Needless to say, Paul VI had him back immediately. But uh, uh, Pius XII asked Bonini to reform Holy Week. Now, there's two parts of the, of the Roman Missal. The Ordo Missa, the unchangeable part, and the Propers. Now, the most important part of the Propers is Holy Week, needless to say. And he wanted Holy Week to be changed. I have to remind you of the fact that uh, the, the ceremony on Good Friday, the, the Mass of the pre-sanctified, is the oldest part of the entire Latin Roman liturgy. The Mass of the Pre-Sanctified most probably goes back to the times of the Apostles. I mean, as is. Until Pius XII. Uh, there is no time tonight, unfortunately, to explain the changes. I would like to give a three-hour conference on that, and it would be worth it, but uh, you just look it up. You try to find a missile that uh, was printed before 1949 and one that was printed after 1955, and you compare the changes. And you will be surprised. There's one change only that I'm going to put out, to point out. In the old liturgical rules, there's a reason why you will never see a black curtain on the tabernacle. Even in a requiem mass, the curtain on the tabernacle has to be violet as reverence to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, with that, ex with that in mind, as an excuse, Bonini, in 1950, in 1949, changed the Good Friday liturgy around, and instead of wearing a black chasuble all through Mass except the Adoration of the Cross, the priest now wears a black cope until the communion rite, and then he wears a violet chasuble at the communion rite. Now, the excuse for this change, which was unheard of in the Catholic Church, the excuse for this change was reverence to the Blessed Sacrament. But at the same time, they abolished the incense. In the old days, before 1949, the Blessed Sacrament, first of all, no communion to the people, and I refuse it on Good Friday. Uh, the, the Blessed Sacrament was kept, was kept on a side altar that was beautifully decorated. And then uh, after the adoration of the cross and the improperia, the priest would, in a solemn procession, pick up the Blessed Sacrament, carry it over to the altar, and all the way it would be incensed. It would be incensed at the special side altar. It would be incensed with the uh, thoroughfare walking backwards. And two of them, as a matter of fact, on the way to the altar. And then it would be incensed on the altar. 
And uh, after elevating the pattern with the host, which is not to indicate consecration, but just to show the, our Lord to the people, the priest would not just genuflect, but make uh, a reverence down to earth, which is exactly how the consecration was done in the early days, before they had to, uh, they had to stop insisting on it, because old priests and old bishops were not able to perform that anymore. And uh, this is one of the most fundamental changes in reality, because it's the first time that any pope ever dared to attack or to touch the oldest part of the entire liturgy. Now, in the Eastern churches, you still have pre-sanctified masses on the Ember Days, but in the Catholic Church, the Mass of the pre-sanctified Good Friday is the last one left, was the last one left, because now, of course, they forget it. Um, so this is just to show you what Pius XII did. Don't ever think that Pius XII was the last conservative pope. He was anything but conservative. He was Catholic. He had the faith. He proved this in writing. He gave it to us in writing, so to say. But in his actions, he was the first pope of the new church. And don't forget, König, Alfrings, Döpfner, Swinnen, Leonard, and all these people were appointments by Pius XII. He chose them. And don't tell me, yes, but he didn't make them cardinals. That's not true. He didn't make them cardinals because he didn't want to make them cardinals, but because after 1953 he did not appoint a single cardinal anymore. And uh, don't tell me that he wanted to get rid of Montini by making him Archbishop of Milan. Please don't, because Pius XII was not an imbecile. Pius XII knew that the, Arch, uh, the Archdiocese of Milan had given to the Church the Pope who made him Secretary of State, Pius XI. Pius XI was Archbishop of Milan. So if you want to get rid of a Monsignor, you do not make him Papabile, right? And the only reason why Montini was not a cardinal in 1958 is because nobody got appointed anymore after 1953. So we have to, we have to notice, sadly, that the influence... Now, parenthesis, I am firmly convinced that Pius XII did not realize what he was doing. But this is not the point of the conference here. We are not sitting in judgment over poor Eugenio Pacelli. We are discussing historical facts and nothing else. And as a historical fact, Pius XII was not a conservative pope, he was not a traditional pope, he was just barely Catholic in his writings. What he did to liturgy is far underestimated. In 1958, when uh, Pius XII died, the only part of the Roman liturgy that was intact and well-preserved all over the world was the canon, nothing else. In 1949, Pius XII gave permission to the Chinese to say Mass in the vernacular, except for the canon. In 1958, just a few months before he died, just about in time, he gave permission to the German bishops and the Austrian bishops and the German-speaking bishops in Switzerland to say the reading and the gospel in German right up there on the altar. That means for the first time, you were give, you, uh, the priest dressed as a priest with his maniple and chasuble on was speaking the vernacular and not only the vernacular but on the altar of Christ he was reading a lousy translation instead of the word of God. So this is what Pius XII did and many other little details for which we do not have time. So by the time uh, 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 Pius XII died the church was indeed ready for the revolution absolutely and totally ready for it. The reason why our dear friend Archbishop Lefebvre uh, always pointed out 1958, 1958, 1958 is simple. People get confused when you tell them the whole story. So it is easier uh, to point out 1958 for pastoral reasons uh, because if, uh, in, uh, you know how it is as a priest you ask many questions. And most, and many people will come up and say, Father, can I trust this book? And I will look it up and say it was printed before 1958. You probably can trust it. So it's just, uh, it's a way of simplifying things for uh, necessities. And uh, this is what Archbishop Lefebvre had in mind when he said 1958 and 1958 was the change. But in, in, in many of his sermons, he explained very well that indeed this was not a, a radical change, but something that grew like a cancer. 
So in 1958, the church was already in a mess. The only thing is you couldn't see it. Very few people saw it. But Pius XII left, left a shipwreck, and Paul VI sunk it. And, uh, well, there's very little to say about John XXIII. He, we know he was a communist because uh, uh, in 1958, in 1955, I think it was, or 54, when he became a patriarch of Venice, he helped the communist unions in Venice. This was at the time when Pius XII had put the membership of the Communist Party under excommunication. And this was the time the two most important, the, the three most important factors of destruction in the church grew. That was during the 19 infelicitous years of Pius XII. The three most important were the new popes, the new liturgy, and the Opus Dei. The Opus Dei, which is the heart and the brain of the conciliar church in reality. The so-called, and that will have to be taken back in the future, the so-called blessed Jose Marie Escri Escriva de Balaguer uh, admitted members of the Communist Party, and mind you, I read this in books published by the Opus Dei or endorsed by the Opus Dei. I do not make the mistake of quoting other people against the Opus Dei. Pius XII admitted, uh, excuse me, uh, José María Escriva de Balaguer, the founder and the first prelate of the Opus Dei, admitted members of the Communist Party into the Opus Dei without, without asking them to leave the Communist Party in a time when membership in the Communist Party was under excommunication. So far about blessed José María Escriva de Balaguer. And uh, John the Twenty-Third did exactly the same in Venice when he was patriarch, Archbishop of Venice. Of Venice. And uh, I guess as far as historical things are concerned, that's where we can stop because everybody present and everybody who will see this tape will know what to think about Paul VI, I, I hope. I should say something about the past of Paul VI. In the 1930s, uh, a certain book called L'Humanisme Integral, Integral Humanism by a certain Jacques Maritain, which is a book that postulates the impossible and the blasphemous because it postulates uh, the reconciliation of humanism and Christendom. This book was translated by a certain Giovanni Battista Montini into Italian and got an absolutely uh, spectacular preface. The translator loved the book. And that was a spectacular happening in those days, in a time when Pius XI had, had people thrown out for things like this. I don't know why Montini survived past the 11th, but I guess it was because a certain Gaspari, whom I mentioned before, was the Secretary of State. Giovanni Battista Montini was certainly the person who found and discovered Bunini under Pius XII. However, this does not change what I said before, because Pius XII celebrated those changes himself. He, he approved of them, he agreed with them, he had them published, he had them man made, he made them mandatory, mandatory, and he changed them, and he used them. And the same Pius XII uh, uh, had, I'm sure this was Cardinal Bea, who discovered the, uh, the Jesuits who would translate the Psalms of the Breviary. That means the 150 Psalms of David, which would have meant the end of Gregorian chant. You cannot use those psalms for singing. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. And uh, so 1958, the church was a wreck. The uh, Vatican Council, which should be subject of another talk of mine, because uh, that's not something I can, I can deal with in 10 minutes. Vatican Council established something that a certain Bishop Carroll of Carrollton in 1789 in this country had already uh, wished for the American church. That means ecumenism, liberalism, and uh, a lack, a lack in, in liturgical discipline, and vernacular liturgy, and all that garbage. Uh, Paul VI instituted it. The Vatican II postulated it. Don't say, don't say the Sacrosanctum Concilium did not want a new liturgy. I will prove to you that it did. 
Paul VI established a new church, which I call the counterfeit church, because it calls itself Catholic. It claims to be founded by Jesus Christ. It was not founded by Jesus Christ. It was founded by Paul VI and his predecessors and Vatican II. And uh, the, the present situation is even worse than what Father Trinchard says in his book. The present situation is even worse. Not only you will find, as Father Trinchard points out very well, in this country you will hardly find a priest left who believes in the real presence. You will hardly find a priest left who believes in the transubstantiation. On the contrary, you will find that only a priest who denies the real presence at least privately, will become bishop. You will find that despite all of his nice little talks, this pope hates the old mass. In, 18, in, in 1988, in a, uh, in a decree that I can only call double fraud, theological and canonical fraud, uh, the present pope claimed that he wished the bishops to be more tolerant with the old mass. A year later, in a speech, he said, Valde dolendum est. It is very hurtful to me that there are still some people left who cling to these forms of worship. So for the present Pope, these are just the traditional Latin Mass, the only Mass of the Latin Rite. If, uh, in eternum, forever, canonized Mass is just another form of worship. And uh, this is so bad that today it is impossible to uh, be promoted in church government in Rome without saying the new mass, without uh, defending Vatican II, and without denying dogma. That means it is a fully and completely, completely heretical church, and Bishop Tissier de Malaret of the Society of St. Pius X very, very rightly said it is, a Gnostic, it is a Gnostic sect. Gnosticism is something which we know to be uh, in deep down a satanic right and a satanic belief and a satanic religion. And the, the counterfeit church, the conciliar church, is a Gnostic sect. And uh, this goes to the point that uh, I do not refer to the uh, very untrustworthy book of Malachi Martin, Windswept House. I refer to uh, uh, information from inside the Vatican. I don't know about any uh, satanic consecration ever done in a chapel in the Vatican. I know that there are active Satanists in the Vatican. I know that one of the secretaries, one of the secretaries of the present Pope was threatened with his life uh, finding uh, uh, graffiti in his own apartment, which is a very secure apartment inside the Vatican, he found satanic graffiti, painted with blood. And uh, they tried to murder another secretary of the Pope, because uh, this present Pope is not good enough for them, believe it or not. When you, if you, when you want to realize in what a state the Church is, then first you have to see in what a state this Pope is. I believe that this present Pope has never had the Catholic faith. His documents prove that to me. Because in his documents, I quote, Catechesi Tradenda number 32, he is quoting, he is quoting uh, Dinitatis Humane number 3, the Pope speaks plain heresy. I do not say that makes him cease to be Pope. I do not say that. It's material heresy. He just writes it. He doesn't say... I want to say something different from the Council of Trent. He does not say, the Council of Trent said, but I say. He just uh, says, I'm perfectly within tradition when I say that a Protestant can be saved through the efforts of the Protestant churches. So that's material heresy. Material heresy doesn't necessarily make him to seize Pope, and a future Pope will have to decide that question anyway, so we cannot endorse and help the city of Acantis. But... When you realize in what a situation we find the church with this pope, and when I tell you that this pope is by far not good enough for them, not heretical enough, not modernist enough, then you know what the church looks like. And I'm talking about the, not just an, a minority clique in the Vatican, but I'm talking about the majority of the bishops. 
I'm talking about the majority of the clergy, to whom this pope is the symbol of conservatism. They just had, uh, they just collected signatures uh, a half a year ago, a year ago, they collected signatures in Austria against this pope because he's too conservative. He's not open enough, not accommodating enough, not ecumenical enough. And here you talk about the pope who worships uh, nature with, uh, uh, with animists in uh, a sanctuary at Lake Togo in Cameroon in 1986. In this, uh, in this regard, I recommend Daniel Leroux's book, uh, uh, Peter, Does Thou Love Me? And uh, the worst thing is, I do not see, humanly speaking, I'm not a prophet. I cannot, uh, I cannot argue with uh, God's providence, and I cannot argue with miracles. But humanly speaking, I do not see the slightest chance of uh, a next pope being elected who would be better. I got to know many cardinals in Rome. The few ones who are better than this pope do not stand the slightest chance, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you wanted to hear what the situation in the church is. This is what it is. This pope is not good enough for them. Even though he speaks about the second Pentecost, he speaks about the church of the new advent, and in his encyclicals, he hardly ever, if ever, mentions the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church. In his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, which is usually called the so-called, which is usually the program encyclical of a pope, he does not mention the word Roman Catholic or Catholic Church even once. Not once. But he speaks about the conscience of the Church. You, uh, living in this country, you just have to switch on TV and you will, the, 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 this will sound familiar, conscience of the church. It's all psychology, psychology, not theology. And he speaks about the church of the new advent, which for this pope who tw uh, three times in a row already claimed that he's not a millenarian. However, uh, this, the year 2000 seems to be the most important thing for him. And, uh, which is ridiculous. It shows that he's a superstitious pagan deep in heart. Yeah. He's an ignorant of theology. He's an ignorant of canon law. He proved that in Ecclesia Dei. And, uh, he seems to be a superstitious pagan because he talks all the time about the year 2000, about the new Pentecost, which is in dogmatically impossible. And he also, he talks about the church of the new advent. What new advent? And this pope is not good enough for them. Curia eleison. So, questions? Where are we going? <laughs> I ain't going to talk because I'm 82 years old. Well, I can only give a, a 30 second sermon on that. Everybody present concerned, starting with me, we shouldn't worry about the last judgment. We have to worry about the personal judgment the moment we die. Make sure you stay in the life of grace and don't worry about when the last judgment is going to come. I don't like Catholic form of rainbow press or weekly uh, world news or national enquire. Well, yeah, I'll no prophecies. Go ahead. We heard um, recently about Rome being upset with the Society of Pius X. <laughs> Naturally. And they're planning to make punishment. Do you have any insight what that might be? No, but it makes me laugh. It's good entertainment. Will they excommunicate us a second time? I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure we will be terribly afraid of that. Yeah, right. Well, no, I have to say for the video, I'm not a member of the Society of St. Pius X, but I work for them and I'm proud of it. Yes? Could you enlarge on the role a little bit of Opus Dei that you mentioned? Yes. Now, uh, the Opus Dei is the intellectual nucleus of the, of the conciliar church. It's the brain of the conciliar church. Because uh, the Opus Dei will openly admit that it was José María Escriva de Balaguer, Escriva de Balaguer who uh, had the idea of Gaudium et Spes, the idea of uh, a church based on the lay people, a church growing from beneath. Which is, a, 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 the church, you have to understand, the church is essentially ecclesiastical, priestly, hierarchical. The church comes from Christ through the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops, and the priests, unto the faithful. It does not grow among the faithful. 
José María Escrivá de Balaguer, all of his life, preached that the church grows on the basis of the faithful, on the laity. And in this regard, I recommend to everybody present that uh, you must read, I demand, if you want to inform yourself, and that's the reason why you're here or watching the tape, you must read the encyclical of Pius X against modernism, Pascendi, Dominici Gregis. You must read it. And you must not just flip through it like uh, a Clive Kessler novel. You have to study it. And you will find, you will find uh, the, the paragraph where St. Pius X says, we are facing a grave danger with, the, uh, with that concept of the laity, the church being based on the laity. So the idea of a church that was based on the laity was condemned by Pius X. But José Marie Escrivá de Balaguer preached it, and who approved his institution? Pius XII, again. And now his institution is the most powerful within the Catholic Church. They are the ones who serve the purpose of appeasing the conservatives by telling them, oh, oh you have to keep the Sixth Commandment and the others too. And uh, they are the ones who will present, who will have their priests uh, in clergymen, cassock, neatly dressed, celebrating the Novus Ordo in vernacular in a decent and nice way. And they are the ones who will tell you that Vatican II can be interpreted in a Catholic sense. It's the Opus Dei, the brain behind that childish and absurd idea that Vatican II could have a Catholic interpretation. There is no way to interpret Vatican II in a Catholic way. I mean, I'm not talking about every single line, obviously. 90% of Vatican II are just uh, 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 warmed up doctrine. And, and uh, the description of papal infallibility in Vatican II is very beautiful, which doesn't help the fact that a few paragraphs later, the infallibility is kind of, you know, uh, put under the table. Swept under the table. I don't talk about what I don't know enough about. I read in Father Francis Nisberger's uh, pamphlet art where he talked about, um, you know, what led up to the Episcopal consecration in 1988. And in a strange way, he sort of did the side and he compared the um, the writings of Pope Pius X from his encyclical on mixed marriages and compared the exact same encyclical that Pope John Paul II wrote on mixed marriages, where Pope Pius X says in no uncertain terms why it's wrong for, say, a Catholic to marry a Protestant or a Catholic to marry yes. any of a non-Catholic. And then in Pope John Paul II's encyclical, he basically says it in, no, in black and white. He says that he encourages Catholics to marry non-Catholics if for no other reason than for more humanists. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Schmidberger is right, but that's not the explanation for that's not the just not the justification of the Episcopal consecrations of 1998, no, 1988. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. He's right. He's right with that. I've never read anything wrong written by a Franz, by, by Father Franz Schmidberger. No, no. I've never. I read. I read practically everything he wrote, and everything was uh, excellent uh, theology and 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 uh, down to the point. The, the Episcopal consecrations of 1988 are very, very easily justified. The last canon of the new code of canon law says that the, uh, the most important law uh, of the church is to save souls. So uh, with the new right, which is against divine law, you cannot save souls. You cannot save souls with young people who want to become priests and have to accept a heretical council and uh, 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 an ordo mister that is at least leading to a ter at least leading to a heresy, uh, you cannot have Catholic priests that way. And there's no official seminary in the in the so-called Catholic Church that would ordain a young man who does not accept Vatican II and who does not accept the new right. So, for the in order for the church to survive, we need bishops. Bishops to consecrate and create priests. And this is why those four bishops were consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre. This was an act of self-defense of the church, perfectly justified by the law of necessity. 
And as a matter of fact, the moment, see, self-defense takes place, has to take place the moment you see. If you see a girl raped on the other sidewalk of the street, you can't say, I'm going to help you in an hour from now. You have to act right now and right here. And the moment Archbishop Lefebvre realized and had proof for the fact that Rome was going to trick him into submission, he acted. And he consecrated the bishops. Not because he wanted to, not because he enjoyed it, but because he had to. He was the only one who, except Castro, my Bishop Castro Maya, they were the only two ones who understood the situation. They had to act. Thank God, amen. Yes. Okay, how does that relate to Archbishop Tooth on Star Five Phoenix? You see, you know. I do not know enough about the case to talk about it. We, we met some priests in Los Angeles. Uh, a priest. Yeah. A brother and him and his other brother, they both uh, became priests. And they're traditional priests and everything about. Uh, yeah, I do not know enough about it to talk about except it. Except they came to study the contest stand. And, Which is uh, bad enough. Right. And according to Father Finshaw, they've softened their stand there, but they wrote an excellent book of documentation and almost everything that you said about John the Twenty Third and Vatican II yeah. and Paul VI was in that book. And it was yeah, yeah. Well, I got some of my uh, uh, one of my uh, most important sources of information was a book printed in this country uh, by some crazy set of accountants. Uh, you just have to see through the information. Right. Just take what what uh, what is worthwhile and what is not. Because these people usually are not theologians and they are not able to do theological distinctions. And before we end this today, I'm going to give you three theological distinctions, which I will repeat in every single conference, because you can't hear it often enough. I want you to be able to distinguish between six terms. Act and potency. Act and potency. Objective and subjective. Formal and material. You don't understand these distinctions, you better don't talk theology. Because uh, the greatest problem today is most priests are completely incapable of uh, distinguishing uh, objective, subjective, and formal and material. And I will give you the explanation. Act and potency is easy to understand. Anything that is in reality is an act. Anything that could be in reality is in potency. So I am a priest in act. I am a father in act, spiritually. I'm a, I'm a father physically in potency. Hope never in act. I am a bishop in potency. I am a pope in potency. And I'm a saint in potency. But I'm not a mother in potency. Potency means there is a potential. It could be. It can be. Act means it actually is. And the reason why you need this distinction is not for itself. Anybody can see that. Scholastic philosophy is common sense and nothing else. The reason why this distinction is very important is because you understand the heresies of today much better when you understand it. What would you say if I stood up now and said, I am Pope? You'd call the, you'd call the ambulance, right? I hope so. Or you'd kick me out, or you'd give me another drink to make sure I become God or something like this. But, and yet I spoke the truth. I am, I am the Pope. Yes, in potency. And see, this is what they do in Vatican II. They tell you something in potency, but they do not say it is in potency. This Pope says, all men will be saved. Potentially, yeah, sure, sure, sure. In act, definitely not. Christ has died for all people in potency, but not in act. It won't take place. Those who reject him, he did not die for in the end. In potentia and in actu, that you have to understand. And when you speak normal language, and believe me, according to the laws of canon law, and according to the laws of theology, and according to church tradition, when you pronounce something in church teaching, you have to use everyday common, correct language, and not some fantastic newspeak, or politically correct garbage. So when you say, this and this is so and so, you presume the reader will say in act, not in potency. So you're not allowed to say that uh, uh, this is my child is given for all. It's only in potency given for all, not in act. But you do not say in potency or act here. You do not say it. So you presume one of the two. And in, every, in everyday language, you presume in act. This is why you would presume that I am crazy when I, if I told you I am Pope. And yet it's true. I am the Pope. 
not much probability to it, but uh, w when I think who, got, who became Pope in 1978, I give myself a chance. Huh? So, uh, in potency, I am Pope. In potency, he is Pope in potency. Huh? But if I was going to say, uh, Father Twin Shard is Pope, you would say, oh yeah, sure, another one who cracked up. Remember we took an oath, uh, there's always a strange clause in it, oath against uh, modernism. Yes. But there's always a strange clause that uh, it stuck in my mind, that we accept things the way they're written. Yes, and exactly. And Vatican II had a part like that. Yes. You ex accept it the way yeah. it is according to the Exactly. Right? And that is, uh, yeah, that is the rule of the interpretation of canon law codified again in the 1983 Code of Canon Law, this Pope signed. Huh? So this Pope is bound to it. And when he says, when he says uh, that all people uh, are saved by Christ, he cannot presume that we will understand impotency. And I don't care what he thinks, he said that they are all saved in act. Well, actually, he doesn't formulate it that directly. Huh? This Pope is too intelligent and too literary a man to uh, pronounce a heresy of this kind uh, too clearly. So I did not quote the Pope now, but I quoted the Pope when I said that the Protestants are saved through the efforts of, the, of their churches. For those who like quotations, yes, that's heresy against uh, the Council of Florence, Pope Eugene IV, then Singer Schönmetzer Collection 1325. And uh, in Catechesi uh, Tradendi number 32, the Pope says, Quarum ope Spiritus Christi non abnuit salutem affere. For the efforts of whom, and he, uh, the, the, the line before says, Ecclesia Protestantice, the Protestant churches, for the efforts of whom the Spirit of Christ does not die to give, uh, deny, does not deny to give salvation. That's explicit written heresy, and I don't give a damn about what the Pope thinks. This is what he wrote. This is material heresy. Because it said it cannot be right? No, because it's material heresy. Next distinction. Objective, subjective. We talk about salvation. So material heresy... Wait a second. Third distinction. We are at the second distinction. Objective, subjective. When I said to us, a judge of the Supreme Court in Vienna, and I guess this is a really... Uh, this is really something else. A, a, a judge of the Supreme Court in Vienna who doesn't understand the distinction of objective subjective so you don't have to be ashamed uh, he said when I when I quoted Pope Eugene the fourth he said are you trying to tell me that all and every single Protestant will go to hell and I said uh, your honor if you are not able to distinguish subjective and objective then you should not talk he was deeply offended, got up and left, and so I had all the peace and the time to explain to those who were left, who had, who, who, were, who stayed, that uh, the church is not able to dead. We do not have the slightest idea what happens to a Protestant when he kicks the bucket. We don't know, but objectively speaking, he has no chance to be saved. Pope Eugene IV said, whoever is not in union with the Roman pontiff, may he even think of shedding his blood for Christ, he cannot be saved. So when this Pope speaks about Protestant martyrs in Czechoslovakia, he speaks heresy and blasphemy too. Objective, subjective, and not material and formal. Material and formal should really be easily understood. Material means the matter, the material. Formal means the meaning. So let's say I make a mistake in a sermon, and making a mistake in a sermon, I pronounce something wrong. Uh, objectively, it's material heresy. Subjectively, it is not. Uh, you've got two distinctions at once here. Subjectively, it's not because I didn't realize it. Even. I mean, I didn't even notice what, uh, that I, I left out a word or, or said yes or, uh, instead of no. So subjectively, I do not commit the sin of heresy. Objectively, it's a heresy because I'm saying something against the doctrine of the church. But this is still material heresy because I do not say that I want to say something against the doctrine of the church. Formal heresy is when you want to say something against the doctrine of the church, and when you say so, so it becomes formal. The only way to, be, to, to speak formal heresy is to tell everybody present, the Council of Trent taught that Christ is really present on the altar, but I say he is not. 
Now that's formal heresy. But if some idiot or warped mind, like John Paul II, say he is a warped mind, then I can prove it. Uh, when, he, uh, when he says uh, a Protestant can be saved through the efforts of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the Protestant churches, and at the same time he claims to be in perfect union with the tradition of the church, then I would say he's ignorant and maybe a crackpot, and definitely a, formal, a, a material heretic, but this is not formal heresy. If he said, I don't care what Pope Eugen IV said, but I tell you that a Protestant can be saved, okay, we got him down. In that case, he most probably would cease to be Pope, I say. Right? But uh, this is not the case. So you have to remember those three distinctions. That's the last thing I'm going to say tonight. Material, formal, objective, subjective, and act and potency. Yeah, maybe you have to bring in the juridical. In other words, with the state of the contest, Who's going to make a decision in the external form? And that, that's obvious. That's, that's, that's right, yeah. If this Pope said, uh, I don't care what uh, Pope Eugen IV said or the Council of Trent, I say something else, then who will judge where the formal heresy starts? Who will, and who who, will judge the Pope? Who will judge the Pope, yeah. No one in Rome. No, Canon 333, paragraph 3, Prima Sedes Animini Judicato, the Holy See cannot be judged by anyone. Huh? So, so we'd just be, no, we'd, we'd be hanging in midair with a question mark. That's all. Well, then, so, yeah. Pope John Paul II must have a very clear understanding of me, uh, material and formal. Because no, I don't think so, because first of all, his philosophy is extremely lousy. His, uh, his uh, theological upbringing is, un, under, uh, the, uh, is beneath the regular standard. Well, and his knowledge. understanding of canon law, his ignorance of canon law is proven in Ecclesia Dei where he speaks about schism with the Society of St. Pius X, while Ratzinger says they are not in schism, and a recent thesis that had been approved by the Gregorian Papal University in Rome says they are not in schism. The Pope uh, in Ecclesia Dei says they are in schism, three times over he says it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and he doesn't, obviously doesn't understand the meaning of the, of, of the canons that he signed. Well, my point of it is, though, he comes so close to formal heresy, but never quite... Yeah, no, that's no actually, to be quite honest, uh, there is no such thing as coming close to formal heresy. Well, he, 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 there is no such material heresy. Then, I mean, yeah, he is—he's he, he the most—he's—he's most he's the most heretical pope in history. Yeah, definitely. But uh, formal heresy means uh, something uh, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clear. Okay. And as this pope is never, this pope is never clear. I guess I'm trying to decide, does he know? The only thing he's clear about is, is his enjoyment of pagan religions. Does he know he's, he's misdirecting the church? Does he do it consciously, or is he just... Judge not that ye not be judged. He can't judge. The internis ecclesia non judicat. I do not know what the Pope thinks. I do not know what the Pope wants. And even if I would know it, I'm not his judge. I cannot judge the person. I do not talk and refuse absolutely to talk about the person of Karol Wojtyla, his conscience, and his soul. We can just take his actions. Absolutely. I judge his acts, I judge his act, a way of government, and I judge his pronouncement. Nothing else. I do not have the right to, do, to judge anything else, and I, would not have, I do not have the right to speak against anything this Pope said or, or wrote or pronounced unless I can prove what I say. I cannot criticize the Pope for having said that the... the I, I cannot uh, criticize the Pope for Catechesis Tradenda number 32 unless I quote... Eugene the Fourth. I have to quote a predecessor. I cannot quote a theologian against the Pope. The theologians I have do not have the Holy Spirit promised to them. On the contrary, they usually don't have a spark of Holy Spirit in them. Huh? So this is the point. I, I'm not allowed to contradict the Pope unless I can prove to the contrary with a prede predecessor of his, because the Pope, uh, by church tradition, by the oath of incarnation, is bound to follow his predecessors, and he's bound to do so by the fourth chapter of the Dogma on Infallibility, Denzinger Schoenmetzer 3004. Why is, it, why is it like, even on sex education, he speaks out against it in Rome, but yet his cardinals let it happen? Because uh, something that does not have the Holy Spirit, do you expect it to be orderly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, he, should, he, has, he must know what's going on. Uh, he, oh, he knows. You uh, gave us a good background of uh, Pope Pius XII. Could you give us some of uh, John Paul II's um, education? Well, I, I can name a few facts because a lot of it, uh, a lot of it is speculation. 
John Paul II uh, uh, did not have a proper theological education because, uh, understandably so, because it was war. And he had to hide. And then, of course, he went to the Angelicum in Rome. Now, I have six academic degrees from the Angelicum in Rome. I can tell you they are not worth anything. And this pope has his doctorate in theology from the Angelicum in Rome, Bonanotte. I did those degrees because stupid, superficial people in this world want degrees. They want to see degrees. But rest assured, the theology that I learned through uh, the, the, the patience and uh, the patience of other priests and the mercy of God, I did not learn. I learned perhaps in one third of it, I learned at the Angelicum. Two thirds of it, I did not learn at the Angelicum. I almost got brainwashed into the new church by the Angelicum. So the Angelicum is a lousy institution right now, and it was never a very, very good university in the old days. And the Pope's, uh, uh, the Pope's thesis on uh, uh, St. John of the Cross is worth nothing. I haven't read it, but I have very, very good uh, and experienced theologians who read it, and they said it's worth nothing. But it got the highest mark. So, uh, and another thing about this Pope, he never was a Catholic. He did not change. It's not the council that changed the Pope, it's the, it's the Pope who wrote the council. The Pope had the same ideas he has now, long before the council. He wanted the, the, the freedom, I shouldn't say freedom, and this is a country where freedom is sacred, and I agree. The liberty of religions. That's what it should be called. Because freedom means you're free to do your job. Liberty means you're free to do whatever you want. Yeah, license, exactly. So uh, the idea of liber libertas religionum, of the liberty of religions, is, a, is an idea that was very early in his life ingrained in the Pope's mind. Don't forget he was part in a, theor in, in a theater group that uh, was founded by Helena Blavatsky. Ah, uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, anthroposophist. That's uh, practically, uh, as the name says, uh, with Greek names, it's very difficult to to hide the truth because they're so open and clear. Uh, Sophia means wisdom and anthropos is man. So that should tell you enough. The Psalms say something quite contrary to the effect of wisdom of man. <laughs> okay. You know anything about the lady who he is pictured in the woods with on his belly. I am not a member of the Catholic National National Enquirer. <laughs> I'm not. I do not work for Weekly World News. I do not. I, I do not work for Weekly World News, and I prefer Alexander the Sixth. And I prefer Alexander the Sixth, who had children even when he was Pope, over Paul the Sixth a hundred times. <laughs> Alexander the Sixth was a rotten, filthy pig, but he did not buy the church. I have a question and a comment. Go ahead. You made a comment. Well, it's for both of you, but you made a comment about about things being turned as written based on the Vatican II or something like that. Right. And that reflects on something on the other line. You know, every time we read something from the old Catholic tradition or writings or any of the popes and take a look at compared to say John the Twenty Third or on to Vatican II and the current Pope. In that almost every writing that we read, we, they get to the point within the first paragraph. And any average person like us can understand exactly what they mean. But when we read any of the new Catholic stuff, it's so ambiguous, you can't read it without constantly going to the dictionary, constantly trying to make some sense of it. And then having to become your own theologian because you don't understand what they mean. That's the bad side of it. The good yeah. side of it is that the simple people will not bother read it and will right. be less distracted yeah. from the Catholic faith. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you understand it, then you better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, in, in, um, if you want to read language yeah. like this, I recommend the book, uh, Politically Bad, uh, Politically Correct Bedtime Stories, but not this Pope's, <laughs> Pope's Encyclical. The no. Politically Correct Bedtime Stories is a good book. This Pope's Encyclicals are trash. Now, the question yeah. is. Very dangerous trash. There was been talk about Pope John XXIII when he was elected. Yeah. And they asked if he knew what he would call himself. He, he was already prepared. Uh, National Enquirer again. Well, yeah, but the fact that there was already. How would you know? How would you know? How would you know what his reasons are? Any pro, any cardinal who speaks uh, about what what happened in the conclave uh, is excommunicated. Do you think that a cardinal who doesn't care about being excommunicated or not would necessarily tell you the truth? When Cardinal Koenig of Vienna, the old Archbishop of Vienna, was asked on TV 
if he was a candidate uh, at the at the last conclave, he nodded, broke the vow of uh, conclave once. A few minutes later, he was asked if he was one of those who promoted Karl Wojtyla. He nodded again. So within one minute, a prince of the Holy Roman Church, Cardinal uh, Franz Cardinal König, Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Vienna, Austria, was excommunicated twice. Do you think that a, a man like this, highly intelligent, is interested in telling you the truth? No, he will tell you whatever he thinks is useful. And I cannot be accused of slander if I say that because I'm not saying he lied. I'm just saying how would you trust a man who is not interested in the fact if he's excommunicated or not? He broke the vow of silence. He broke the seal of the conclave. So anybody tells me uh, John the 23rd said the following, blah, 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 blah. The moment he got elected, I will say, uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, I will go to the, next, uh, to the next supermarket and get the National Enquirer because at least it's funnier. Huh? The Weekly World News is a lot more entertaining than those liars are. Subscribe to the Angelus, and if you find sometimes local problems with the Society of St. Pius X, forgive them, they were humans. A century ago, not everything was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful in the Catholic Church. But the ones to look for spiritual guidance, the ones you can trust, the Society of St. Pius X, and the only paper in this country that I would uh, recommend to everybody under all circumstances is the Angelus. Amen to that.